really what it comes down to is if you can inspect the circuit board well enough to find all the defects on it, then of course it's going to be more reliable, right? So as we've gotten better and better as the technology, as the special technology has gotten better and better, we've been able to determine if there's like, say, subtle lead lift, we've been able to pick up cold solder joints, we've been able to pick up micro cracks and BGAs. We've been able to pick up a lot of that stuff that wasn't, that we weren't really able to pick up prior. That's just, just simply because the technology wasn't there yet. We didn't have the proper camera technology. We didn't have the proper methodology, you know, 3D, 2D combined. We didn't have the proper methodology, camera technology. It just wasn't there to pick up those subtle defects. And those subtle defects would be escapes. That's it. That's just the way it was. So you put a board out into the field and it gets, you know, stressed with hot, cold, hot, cold, and the solder joint cracks because it's just a very small solder joint, right? Or you have a micro crack that you didn't pick up, which the component worked properly at one point, but then it just, you know, continued to crack. But that's just basically where we're at. As the technology gets better, we we really, it sounds kind of strange, but understand the manufacturing process better and we have the better tools to deal with it, we are building reliability into the product. My guest today comes from the automated optical inspection and solder paste inspection industries. He's next on Reliability Matters. Welcome to Reliability Matters, a podcast for the electronic assembly industry. Each episode covers topics related to reliability, best practices, and environmentally responsible assembly techniques with insights from experts across the electronic assembly industry. Now, here's your host, Mike Conrad. With over 36 years of experience in the electronic manufacturing and test equipment industry, my guest started out his career in field service and applications engineering with Eaton Corporation's Memory Test Systems Division. This is where he developed strong technical skills as well as an enthusiasm for effectively managing customer expectations, which is obviously no easy feat. My guest was then moved to Contact Systems, where he managed a global network of manufacturers, representatives, and distributors in the sale of automated SMT and through-hole assembly equipment. He also worked with both MyData, now known as Micronic, and Quad Systems Corporation. In 2004, my guest, along with his business partner, established Mertec Corporation, which is Mertec Company Limited's North American Sales and Service Division. Since 2004, Mertec has become a well-known and successful supplier of automated optical inspection, AOI, systems and solder paste inspection systems known as SPI systems. My guest today is perhaps the best dressed member of the electronic assembly industry, my friend and colleague Brian D'Amico. Welcome, Brian. Thanks, Mike. Are you wearing your uh, trademark orange tie at this moment or or are you casual? It's a casual Friday. what do you think? I have to. For all phone calls, I wear that tie. Well, I think you sleep in it. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's like one of the best kept secrets in the industry. You're oh, just well, all this you stuff know, now. <laughs> hey, you, you come here for the latest uh, gossip, uh, industry gossip. <laughs> Brian, you are you are living proof that working in this industry is much like a life sentence. 36 years. Is that right? 36 years? Yeah, I know I look 25, but yeah, it's been about 36 years now. <laughs> yeah, clearly you started in utero, right? So before you were even born. Uh, I know, I, I know, and I've I, when I read your bio, I, I kind of gave the badge trail of companies that you've worked at. So what I'd like to know is what led you to this industry, uh, it, the electronic manufacturing industry in the first place? Okay, well, actually, yeah, when I first started out, I was working with the Eaton Corporation, and that was mainly a test in test systems division we were testing you know pcbs from there i did that for about 10 years went from of course i went from field service to applications to sales and then after that my next position was with contact systems and they were of course an assembler of equi- of a machine so it was more from the manufacturing side of things where i sold assembly equipment for both smt and through hole and that's where i got kind of indoctrinated into manufacturing and uh it's been it's been manufacturing all the way since. I've worked for a couple of different assembly companies that you had mentioned. And, and from there, I met with the, uh, my partner at now. Actually, at that time, he was, uh, I was a distributor, and I met with Chamwa Pak. And that's the first time that I had ever seen an inspection machine. And quite frankly, I got very enamored with it. It was a small little desktop machine, and I just saw such potential with that. That was back around the year 2000. That was a long time ago. <laughs> that was back when I had hair, Mike. 
And uh, <laughs> after long seeing ago, that, huh? and <laughs> you didn't know me back then. But after seeing the capabilities of what that little machine can do, you know, seeing what exactly it could do for manufacturers, uh, that really that really got my interest. And that is something that I'm very passionate about, been passionate about, believe it or not, all those years. Uh, it's all these years. It's really cool stuff. I enjoy it. You know, some of the more successful people that we read about, um, some of the legends, you know, Steve Jobs or Bill Gates, uh, maybe more Steve Jobs than Bill Gates, uh, are more known for not so much inventing something, but seeing something and seeing a larger use for it, right? Um, and yeah. not, I'm, I'm not calling you uh, Steve Jobs, although, you know, maybe maybe some of that applies, but, but um, clearly um, – seeing something and seeing a larger potential, uh, is, uh, is, is really a key to success. So one of the great things about doing this podcast is I get to interview all these experts in equipment that I'm aware of, but I really know nothing about. Um, I just, I just, I just know it, you know, cause it, through osmosis. Uh, so help me understand the difference between AOI, uh, automated optical inspection and SPI, solder paste inspection. Is it, is it basically similar technology used for different applications or is, is the underlying technology different? Well, the underlying technology that we use that we employ is actually Moire. So Moire is a methodology by which you can collect 3d information, right? You're basically trying to create a 3d profile of some region of interest. So that is the underlying technology between SPI and AOI, but there's a couple of different ways of doing it. So when you're dealing with SPI, we're dealing with Moire, but we're only dealing with one frequency or one, it's very basically a small pattern that we're producing, a very tight pattern we're producing that we're displaying or projecting onto solder paste, right? We're just testing for solder paste, solder paste inspection. So we really don't need to have what's called multi-frequency moire, which is what we use for AOI. There we need a couple of different patterns because we're dealing with some taller profile devices. So when you're dealing with low profile solder paste, it's just a matter of dealing with a different pattern generation for using moire for solder paste inspection versus automated optical inspection. And then from there, with AOI, you require not only 3D, but you also require 2D, right? You're looking at part markings, you're looking at perhaps color bands on resistors. So you require a more sophisticated, I guess, engine, if you will, when it comes to AOI, than you require for SPI. But the underlying, the thing that makes them both work and the thing that they share in common, let's put it that way, is going to be more, you know, it's 3D profile characterization of what's on the printed circuit board. So that's in a nutshell. Cool. So if you and I were just sitting at a bar having a beer and you said you dropped the term like moire i'd go yeah okay i i don't know what that means but i'm not going to say anything so I, but i because because this podcast uh goes out to people even outside of our industry um they might be sitting there going what is he talking about so tell me what what is what is moire and and you know, what's what's the technology behind it and what is it in general well, okay, no problem. I get that. You know, as a matter of fact, let's put it this way. If we're sitting there and we're having a beer and we're talking about more, we have a bigger problem than, than this. <laughs> <laughs> then it's a very boring bar. Yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> it's a boring bar. Uh, all right, so more has been around, believe it or not, for about 60 years now. It's been around for a very long time. But what it is, is it's a means of characterizing things in 3D. So, for instance, what you're doing is actually you're taking a, a line pattern that you project down onto a region of interest. And by shifting that line pattern, right, so you're basically taking that pattern, projecting it down at an angle, and then you shift that pattern. And as you shift the pattern, you're basically capturing an image with a top-down camera, or no matter what, you can do it from a top-down or side view camera, but you're capturing the image of the line pattern as it's shifted across a region of interest. In doing that, what you look for is anomalies to that line pattern. So for instance, if you were projecting a line pattern down onto a printed circuit board with nothing on it, completely nothing on it, it was a flat surface, then the line pattern that we would capture with the camera would be perfect, right? It would be, all the lines would be spaced properly. We'd see all the edges very clearly, and we'd be able to tell the distance between each line is all the same. Everything looks uniform. But now if we throw an object in the middle of that line pattern, it's going to take in, move the line pattern, right? It'll take in, it'll make the line pattern shift a little bit. That's what's called contouring. So you'll be able to pick up the contours of the device by the differences between the way the line pattern should look if there's nothing there 
and the way the line pattern looks when there's something in the way or something obstructing that line pattern. So that's used in order to come up with the contours or the profile of the region of interest, whether that be solder or whether that be, you know, a solder joint, solder paste, components, leads, what have you. All those are going to take and they're going to modify what that line pattern looks like by simply being in the way of that line pattern. So really more is a means of projecting a pattern and collecting images with a top down camera, side view camera, and noticing the differences between the line pattern if there was something there or, or nothing there at all. Okay. And in a nutshell, that's basically it. Now the formulation for doing that, the formulas for it are extremely difficult. It's that's just a lot of data that you're crunching. It's a lot of information, a lot of points of data. But that's really the methodology. Are the formulas that interpret all that data um, proprietary from manufacturer to manufacturer, or does everyone buy the same technology uh, behind that? No, when it comes to the math that really does that stuff, that's all pretty much the same. The differences are the way that you produce the line patterns, uh, the the hardware that used to do that, the the camera that you're using to capture the information. Like, of course, we're talking about high end, high resolution cameras. Um, when you're also talking about the camera lenses, you can get down to, you know, sub micron or you can have 20 micron. So realistically, it's just the hardware around that. And then also the software, because one of the things that is done with Wari is you're going to have a lot of noise. So what you're going to have to do is filter out the bad noise. But you want to do that without filtering out good data. So the differentiators between different vendors of AOI SPI equipment is really the hardware that's used to produce this, to collect the data, right? To produce the imagery, to collect the data. And then, of course, the differences between how you take that data and you present it to the real world, right? And how you take that data and modify it in a way that it's, you're not you're getting rid of the noise that you don't want, but keeping good data and you want to achieve repeatability. There's a lot of stuff around that. So really the differences between the vendors is is how they kind of manage this whole process. Sure. It sounds like there's a lot of software discernment going on. You know, what part of the image do you throw away? What do you keep? One thing I learned from Dirty Harry a long time ago is a man's (laughs) got to know his limitations and that's my limitation. (laughs) I love the fact that we got a Clint Eastwood reference in this podcast. That's, Took awesome. a while to get that out, but I did. <laughs> hey, you're the first. You're the first. So I'll check that one off the list. Uh, so let's talk about AOI and SPI. They've been around for some years. I know at least 2004, because that's when you discovered that technology and got into the business. So every year I see you being interviewed in your trademark orange tie discussing the latest technology. I could see you on a Monday and you'll say something new. And then on Tuesday, you'll do another interview and there's still something new. (laughs) So, so clearly it's an evolving uh, technology. Um, So walk me through the technology roadmap. What's changed since your first involvement uh, or maybe even before, if you're aware of it, uh, from 2004 or earlier until now. What's improved in general with these types of machines? And and what stayed the same, if anything has? Okay. All right. Well, not too much has stayed the same except for we're still dealing with, dealing with optics, of course, right? We have to look at, look at the uh, different boards that we're manufacturing and solder paste and, and uh, devices, et cetera. But back when I first was indoctrinated into inspection equipment. It was back in the year 2000, right? And machines had been around long before that, quite frankly, but the machines that were around were some, you know, high end cost you three hundred, five hundred thousand dollars $500,000. But the only way that you would be using them is they took so long to program. They'd be like a week to program for one particular PCB. So that's a very long time. And it really doesn't fit into anybody's business model now. There's no way, right? especially in the states where we're dealing with low to medium volume, high mix. So those big machines that were around back then, they were all 2D, but we're dealing with multiple images. And we would, of course, capture an image and compare it to an existing image. And bottom line is it would be just a whole bunch of imagery that we capture for doing comparison. Over the years, 2D has gotten better and better and better. And like I had mentioned, when I saw that first desktop machine back in 2000, that first desktop machine did a better job of inspecting than some of these $300,000 machines. That's what really kind of turned me on about it. I mean, it was that little tiny desktop machine that we had sold at that time, I think it was 60, 70 K would do a better job than like a $300,000 machine that someone could buy. And the best part about that is 
you'd be able to produce a program very quickly. And that's something that's very important, right? Well, as time has gone by, camera technology has gotten better. And that's very, very important because camera technology is really where it's at. That's the heart of any AOI inspection system. So camera technology has gotten better. Of course, the speed at which we can capture imagery and process images, we're talking about dealing with computers, right? Multi-core computers, multi-core processing has really gotten better. So the speed at which, at which we can run production on a machine has changed dramatically. And then, of course, we had the advent of 3D. Now, 3D technology adds a different element, right? There's With 2D technology, there are limitations. Not to say that 3D is everything, right? Both 2D and 3D have got their own specific set of advantages and disadvantages. But in going from 2D to 3D, we were really able to deal with some of the difficulties that we couldn't overcome with 2D. And that would be perhaps subtle lift on devices like 01005s, you know, 03015s. Those are very small devices. And that's a very big challenge for 2D to determine if the PCBs are manufactured correctly with these types of devices. Right. Also subtle lead lift to, to leads, those kind of things. That's where 3D really does play a big role. So over the years, we've gone from, you know, clunky machines that took weeks to program to being able to program very quickly, but some of the limitations there, and as the components have gotten smaller and smaller and boards have gotten denser and denser, we've had to change that technology a little bit, hit more advanced optic systems. And then, of course, the advent of 3D mixed in with 2D now allows us to deal with virtually any device that's on the PCB. That's where things have gone. And, you know, that happened within the last 19 years. And who knows where it's going to be years from now. But it's been a continual advancement of technology all that way. I'm going to get, I'm going to ask you a little later to get out your crystal ball. So just, just uh, <laughs> th start thinking about the future. Uh, well, I think everyone, all, my all my audience, whether they're in this industry or not, or, or have experience with AOI systems or not, can clearly identify with one of your comments that camera technology has been getting better. I mean, we see that on our iPhones and Android phones. You know, they're they're amazingly clear, and you know the depth of field and and the color clarity is amazing. And I imagine in your business too, since you rely on cameras at the end of the day, have seen that. In your industry, uh, is megapixel the, the, the unit of measurement in your industry as well, or is there more to it than that? No, it is. But the thing that's a little bit different between like camera phone technology and what we're using for for an inspection system is we're really dealing with like industrial cameras, right? We're dealing with cameras where we're talking about being able to you know, capture 200 frames per second. We're really fast cameras. Now, yeah, of course, we're actually going to 300 frames per second. Wow. Now, we at Murtech, we manufacture our own camera. So we have our own camera division, which we believe is the only way to go because we've tried out so many different types of cameras out there over the years that we decided, okay, nobody's going to do it better than us. Quite frankly, that's where it's at. Well, we, we you know specifically what your needs are, right? I mean, you Absolutely. know what your needs are. They're probably a little different than other camera applications. So that that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. For inspection, especially inspection of very small devices where you're talking about, and sometimes you're, you know, talking about sub pixel processing, of course, all the time you're talking sub pixel processing, but you're talking very minute features that you're looking for and you're looking for repeatability, which is extremely important. You know, you don't want it where you run the board and you get 10 defects and then you run it again, you get 15 defects. That just kind of, that hurts the whole, point of it, right? You need the repeatability, but that's where you have to have a camera system that's really designed for inspection with low signal to noise ratio, awesome repeatability. It, and it comes down to the pixels within the sensor that you're, that you're dealing with. That is a little bit very, you know, pretty much involved, but, but really, yeah, when it comes to camera technology, megapixels is what you hear about, but you're, for instance, we're dealing with 25 megapixel technology right now for our AOI systems. Well, there's 100 megapixel cameras out there, but the frame rate is, you know, three, three frames per second. That's just not suitable for the inspection. So AOI is market. 25 megapixels, 300 frames per second, which is Actually, staggering numbers. Yeah, it's, yeah pretty so we're fast. Nowhere, we're pretty nowhere, fast a lot of data. We're nowhere near downloading the Murtech app on an iPhone whatever and taking pictures of your board for it sounds like we're quite a bit away from that right maybe that'll be your retirement <laughs> that's gonna be that'll be a future interview there you go okay All right, i'll look forward to that one 
So as a uh, uh, as an equipment manufacturer myself, uh, we have two primary goals. Um, one is to design a machine that will physically function reliably years from the date of purchase. You know, you always want your machines to last. But perhaps even more important and and more challenging by far is designing a machine that can remain relevant and useful many years from the purchase date. It Not just that it will turn on, but it has to still provide a relevancy. I, I would assume in your industry, as much or maybe even more than mine, uh, designing a machine that you sell tomorrow that, that can still be useful many years down the road is challenging. That's the crystal ball part of it, right? You have to know, since you're taking pictures of components, we're cleaning components, you're taking pictures of components, components keep getting smaller and, and more elusive. And, um, and that I would imagine adds challenges and who knows what components are coming tomorrow. So how do you, how do you build in the maximum amount of relevance to your products? Yeah, you're right. That is very much a challenge. One of the things is that we, we do have somewhat of an advantage when it comes to dealing with some of these smaller devices. The, the advantage that we have is really that we, we of course, were based out in Asia. That's where headquarters is. It's in Korea. And that's really the hotbed out there, right? So hotbed of inspection. And quite frankly, we are dealing with some of the higher end devices before they come here to the States and before they get introduced to Europe. That's a good thing. The bad thing is we still have to deal with that stuff, right? So as far as my end of things, some of the devices that are introduced out in Asia, they take a, a while before our contract manufacturers, OEMs, start to see those in the North American market and in Europe. They just take a while to get here, to filter in. So that gives us a little bit of an edge, which is a good thing. But it's always evolving. It's always changing, right? You think you're dealing with the smallest device out there, like an 0201, and then, of course, you have the advent of the 0105, and then the advent of the 03015. And each one of these is substantially smaller. I mean, like we're talking a quarter of the size of the predecessor, so they get smaller and smaller and smaller. So there's really no way of knowing exactly where technology is going to end up five, 10 years from now, it just is changing so dramatically. All you can really do is try to develop equipment that is suitable for dealing with what you currently have with a small edge <laughs> and hope that your machine is gonna be able to deal with something that's coming down the pike. When you start dealing with the capability of, of inspecting, say for instance, inspecting 03015 devices, you know that if you have a machine that's capable of that, there's a really good chance you're gonna be able to get a good probably five, 10 years out of that product, but there's gonna be limitations that it may have, like there's some machines that have been out there for 10 years that are incapable of inspecting 0 and 0 05 devices. That's just it. There's no capability to inspect that. And there's no real way of taking and upgrading the system to be able to do that because that's gonna require replacement of everything within the machine itself, the entire optics, the motors, everything within the, you know, the positioning system, and it gets to be too expensive. So what we really shoot for is a machine that's capable, and that's what we really hope for is capable. It's a machine that's capable of dealing with, you know, at least 10 years worth of, of technology changes. And we're pretty much on track for that. We've got machines that have been out there, and I still have machines that have been out there for, you know, 14, 15, 16 years that are still running and are doing very well. But there are limitations to what they can deal with. So the crystal ball thing, that's very much a real issue, right? Nobody's got a really good working crystal ball. Mine's been on the fritz a bit. <laughs> well, well, you know, we, we, we do the same thing. We, we just call it an overkill design. When we design a new product, there's a tremendous amount of overkill. Uh, but as the years go by, the amount of overkill is reduced, you know, and we get closer to the edge of an envelope, right? So yes. it's same thing that I think everyone from reflow to inspection, to cleaning, to placement, all can probably commiserate over the same challenges that components keep getting smaller uh, terminations uh, are more frequently on the bottom of the component out of sight which kind of fuels the x-ray business uh, and to a certain extent your business as well so you kind of uh, alluded to it but i'm going to read this question anyway uh, realistically sure. older inspection are older inspection machines realistically say 10 years old or ish still relevant uh, and you answered Yes, some people are still using them, but they have more limitations. That was your prior answer. But, but uh, do we? At what point? This is maybe a better question. If you were in a, if you were a contract manufacturer, 
and you were building boards with the latest technology and uh, you were asked to uh, to buy an AOI machine and you got the ability to buy anything used. So you could go back in time. You could buy a 2000 AOI machine for $8 or you could buy a, a brand new one for whatever. Where, what would, how far back would you be willing to go to maintain relevancy today? Right. It really does depend because if, and it really depends on what kind of application the potential buyer of that equipment is going to be doing, right? If they're trying to deal with the latest and greatest stuff out there, then really you're talking maybe five years back. Really, that's about it. Beyond that, and of course, there's another thing too, is you start dealing with, you know, good old Bill Gates. We're running off of a Windows platform. As the Windows platform changes, right, as the operating systems change and they stop supporting some of the newer or some of the older, excuse me, operating systems. As, and, as uh, they just did with seven. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so, you know, that happens. It, it just happens. So that's usually on a, I'd say, I don't know, maybe seven, seven to 10 year, you know, where they change operating systems. But I think that that's going to actually be happening more frequently. But anyway, so it really, really comes down to if a customer is willing to deal with an older operating system, then I would certainly say something about five years back, maybe five to 10 years back. If their application isn't for dealing with some very, very small devices, they'd be able to get by with a machine that's, you know, I'd say less than 10 years old. If you've got, of course, more money to invest, then I would want to get it as new as possible. I'd say maybe five years old. Um, if you're looking for something to deal with the latest and greatest stuff that has the capability of, of dealing with some future type of equipment, then I would shorten up on that. I start looking at buying new equipment. And quite frankly, in our, in our technology or inspection technology, 3D has really been going strong for maybe the last five years. We've had a lot of different companies jumping into the mix when it comes to 3D. So that technology is very new. So, and it's, I'm still saying it's new and people kind of look at me strange, but really it's still evolving. And as that evolves, the, it becomes better and better. But if you look five years back, the 3D technology that was available then is nowhere near where it is right now. So if there's a difference in technology and if 3D is very important to that particular vendor, then really you won't be able to go earlier than five years ago. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, sure. It's it a little strange. Yeah. Yeah, I hear you. Uh, and going back a little bit in your earlier comments about uh, Windows, uh, our equipment also runs Windows. We've run Windows 7 for years. And a lot of times Microsoft will come up with the new, you know, the new OS and no big deal. They change the fonts. They change the, the, the emoticons. Uh, but the back end stuff still works fine. We just switched to 10. Oh, my God, that was an amazingly difficult process because everything changed every driver changed yep. everything changed and this that was like a complete rebuild and uh, that was that was quite a challenge so <laughs> the engineers on your side I, I can I can certainly uh, respect the amount of work you have to go through when Microsoft does stuff like that it's uh, it affects everything and the seven yeah. no one went to eight when 10 came out that was an amazing uh, amazing difference so getting back to um, the theme of this podcast, uh, which is reliability, in general, how does optical inspection and solder paste inspection improve the reliability of circuit assemblies? Well, first of all, I thought the theme was my orange tie, but all right, we'll get back to that. Well, the that's the sub theme <laughs> that and Clint Eastwood quotes. <laughs> there you go. They go together really well. You didn't see he had an orange tie under his shirt there. I'm sure stuff. he did. Yeah, I'm sure he did. <laughs> under his pocket. All right. So, <laughs> an orange bandana. Anyways, so it, how does it affect reliability? All right. Well, really what it comes down to is if you can inspect the circuit board well enough to find all the defects on it, then of course it's going to be more reliable, right? So as we've gotten better and better as in technology, as especially technology has gotten better and better, we've been able to determine if there's like, say, subtle lead lift, we've been able to pick up cold solder joints, we've been able to pick up micro cracks and BGAs. We've been able to pick up a lot of that stuff that wasn't that we weren't really able to pick up prior. That's just simply because the technology wasn't there yet. 
We didn't have the proper camera technology. We didn't have the proper methodology, you know, 3D, 2D combined. We didn't have the proper methodology, camera technology. It just wasn't there to pick up those subtle defects. And those subtle defects would be escapes. That's it. That's just the way it was. So you put a board out into the field and it gets, you know, stressed with hot, cold, hot, cold, and the solder joint cracks because it's just a very small solder joint, right? Or you have a micro crack that you didn't pick up, which the component worked properly at one point, but then it just, you know, continued to crack. Or like, you know, with your technology, when it comes to dendrite growth, et cetera, right? People thought it was no problem when it came to just, you know, coating a board. Hey, that's going to be no problem whatsoever. And then you prove, in fact, that, hey, dendrites grow underneath it unless you clean the board. Those kind of things as we become. See, I did that plug for you. Did you like that? I love it. Yeah, thanks. I owe you. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's, this is the uh, Brian D'Amico Show. Thanks for listening. <laughs> <laughs> but that's just basically where we're at. As the technology gets better, we, we really, it sounds kind of strange, but understand the manufacturing process better and we have the better tools to deal with it. We are building reliability into the product. Right. So that's, that's the way I feel about that. So how is the growth of electronics? I, I, I believe right now we're in this explosive growth in electronics with IoT and automotive, just those two things alone. Um, how has that affected uh, your industry specifically? Well, last year was our best year ever. This year here, we're on track to beat that. I mean, we're doing very, very well out there. People are adopting new technology, looking at 2D, 3D technology combined. And we, of course, we got a really good mousetrap out there, and we have a very good following of customers. And as they grow, they look to us, and then they're buying more machines from us. And they're buying new technology, trading in old technology at times, or using that old technology in a different location within their line, say taking an older 2D system, now putting that in the middle of their line to do, you know, post placement inspection. So we're seeing a substantial growth, and that's a great thing, you know. Knock on wood. We're gonna find some wood here. Knock on, knock on wood. Um, we're doing very well. But you're right. When it comes down to automotive, I mean, just look at the vehicles nowadays. They're they're like 80 percent electronics, right? Yeah, <laughs> they, used to they happen to come like with a with an engine or a motor, <laughs> right? <laughs> exactly. So that's I think. I think it will continue to be on the rise and it's, it's great. And then also, I, you know, I think that we have kind of a luxury here being in North America and seeing, you know, I don't know whether it's more economic or political, but there's definitely a uh, definite encouragement to the growth of our manufacturing here in the States. So that's a, that's a nice thing as well. So yeah, it's, it's good. It's very good kind of one of these things where I'm cautiously optimistic that it will continue to be this good. But you and I have been around in this industry for a very long time. We do know that if, if anything, I hate the word, but if anything, it's cyclical. You know, sometimes manufacturing goes through the roof. Sometimes there's a little bit of a lull, but we've been on a, a pretty good rise here. And uh, we are, of course, enjoying that and working with our customers to help them be successful and also take advantage of the opportunities they have with this market at this time. Yeah, I agree with all that. And I'll, I'll add to that. I think, you know, there are two types of, of equipment in our industry. Those that are absolutely required to solder a component to a board. Uh, and then those that are not technically required, but, but quite necessary. And that would be, uh, you know, value added equipment like AOI or cleaning or similar things. You know, obviously someone can solder a board and, and, and ship it out without your equipment and without my equipment. But I think today, because of the growth of electronics, IoT and automotive specifically, that are pushing um, products with boards in it that never had assemblies in it into areas where we never used, used to put assemblies. You know, we're putting electronics in toothbrushes and in footballs and mm. in, in uh, clothing uh, that go out into harsh environments. I think... Today, and with components being so small and the tolerance is so tight and um, there's a certain criticality with with assemblies now, particularly in the automotive industry, I, I like to tell people I've used this a lot. Uh, I have you know two cars that I drive on a regular basis. One's a 1968 Mustang and one is a late model GM product. If every circuit board failed in my Mustang, 100% of the circuit boards, which there are is one, my AM radio wouldn't work. Everything I, I could drive just fine, but my AM radio wouldn't work. If on my late model GM car, 
one board fails, it, it could steer me off a cliff or, or fail to break. <laughs> I mean, it, it could kill me. So, you know, I just read an article that BMW is recalling thousands of electric cars because their tier two supplier failed to clean the boards properly and the boards are shutting down. Um, so I think today our industry is building very close to the edge of the envelope. Components are so small. They're so dense. They're so close to the board surface that getting the component placement right is critical. Getting the solder uh, voiding uh, ratios right is so critical. Getting contamination off of, you know, out of tight spaces is very critical. That businesses like yours and ours and others that provide value added um, really fuel the reliability and help push the product off the very edge of the envelope where it is teetering on falling over otherwise. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, it really does. I mean, you're right. It, all of those factors, you know, like anything else, all the factors that we're talking about here as technology changes, it really becomes a point, like in the inspection type industry, the naked eye isn't going to be able to do it, right? right? The naked eye, you simply can't do it. We were at that. We were actually at that point when we had over O twos, and that was, you know, people were saying, "Oh man, I'm going to start placing over O twos. Get my screen printer handle. Get my pick and place handle. Well, how am I going to inspect it? You know, well, I need a magnifying glass. Well, now it's gotten to the point where you've got thousands, thousands of points on a board that you have to inspect, and you have to inspect well. <laughs> you got to make sure you, make sure there's no escapes because an escape in an automobile is, you know, could be a fatality. So we're talking about people relying, you know, on the inspection process in order to determine whether or not the boards are manufactured well enough for them to work properly as they should without causing any issues. I mean, we, one of the automotive dealers that we deal with is Airbus, you know, automotive, right? So, I mean, when you're talking about, like, when you're talking <laughs> about buses people in their flying name. around, right. <laughs> right? There's like thousands of people that are flying around. Okay. A board goes bad on one of those planes, there's an issue, right? There's definitely an issue. So yeah, I believe that I like the word criticality. You never used it, but I believe that that is. I'm not, quite, I'm not quite certain that's a real word, uh, but uh, I like it. And I'm going to use it too, Mike. It's this word that you just know what it means, even if it's in the dictionary or not. I do. So, I do. And I completely agree with you. So I'm going to ask you to, uh, I'm going to give you a license to defy the laws of physics for a second. I'm going to ask you if you to take off your trademarked orange tie just for a few moments. Don't worry. You can put it back on when we're done. So you don't work for Mertec now. And you need okay. to design the perfect inspection system because it, you're going to build a board that is going to save your life, right? You've got to depend on the functionality of this board for the rest of your life. What features and capabilities would you want your AOI machine to have that are either possible today or not possible today? What would be the perfect AOI machine? Well, I think the perfect AOI machine would be one that can not only see the components on the board, but also see through the components because, as you had mentioned, so there's a also a lot little of little X-ray. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. That would be nice. It's like X-ray can't do everything. AOI can't do everything. So it would be nice to have something where it would be a combined technology or some new technology that would be able to kind of do both. Not only see all of the different because you really still need to be able to see things. Like I mentioned, nomenclature. You got to see nomenclature. Guess what? X-ray doesn't tell you if you've got a 0301 device or an 0101 device. It doesn't tell you that stuff. You still need the nomenclature to determine whether or not you've got the proper device there. You need you need to be able to see if there's stripes on resistors. You need to be able to look at the bands and say what kind of resistor it is, because there's still going to be some through-hole devices and some mixed technology. You still need that. You still need to be able to tell if the lead is lifted or not, if the component is lifted slightly or not. X-ray, that becomes a challenge because you're talking about moving to different angles, and that's really not an inline type of an X-ray system. But the fully capable system or the system of the future would be one that can not only do optical inspection, but also be able to see through to bottom terminated devices to make sure that they're correctly soldered, no bridging, et cetera, and to do all of that, and to do all of that at real-time speed. Now, if you can manufacture a machine like that, then you're going to do a great job and you're going to be invaluable to the industry and you're going to be extremely rich. Let's put it that way. So what I'm hearing is, is <laughs> what I'm hearing is at Apex next year, we're going to see the latest Mertec product, which will be a 25 megapixel, 300 frame per second, high resolution color x-ray. 
Yeah, and we're going to paint the big S on it and call it Superman <laughs> because that's what you said that way it's going to work. All right. Well, and now you tell me to take off my tie, and I did. And that was definitely, that was definitely the well, machine of the future, but I have no idea what technology would get us there. Right, right. One thing I like to ask my guests is what goes wrong. Um, we've got stories from the field of customers that do really funky things. And, and, um, what are the common mistakes when either selecting or even better when using an AOI machine? Do you have any, you can, you can not tell us who the customers are to protect the guilty. Uh, but do you have any, you know, fun stories from the field of, or, or even someone using a machine in a completely unexpected, um, application? Uh, all right. Well, as far as things that can go wrong when you're purchasing equipment, the, the biggest problem there would be when people buy equipment without really knowing what they're going to be using it for, right? They, they're buying a piece of equipment and then they are either buying something that isn't really suitable for the application that they're looking for, you know, or perhaps the board size is different than the machine that they purchase, or they're buying, you know, perhaps a piece of used equipment and not realizing that that equipment really isn't suitable for some of the latest technology that they're dealing with. But really it's, it's, those are the kind of buying decisions where they're really unsure of what they're going to be doing in the future. Like a contract manufacturer would then, you know, turn their sales people on and say, go get me some more business. And then when they go out there and try to get business, they find that the new contracts that they're looking for, the board size just won't fit into their production equipment or they're looking at placing, you know, 03015s and hey, their pick and place machine, their AOI machine isn't capable of processing those devices. That happens. But really, for what can go wrong after you buy the equipment, if you've purchased it and you're buying it for the proper application, all of the equipment that's out there, I, I, it sounds negative in some way, but all the equipment that's out there, really, they're all kind of stupid pieces of equipment, right? I mean, there's they all require human intervention at some point. Now, the machines have gotten better so that we don't really require the artfulness that we needed before when it came to the manufacturing process. Like somebody could run the heck out of a screen printer. Well, the screen printer's got more technology into it, more smarts built into it. And that's the same thing with the assembly equipment, the cleaners, the AI machines, et cetera. They're all smarter systems than they were before. However, they still require human intervention. They still require somebody to create the programs for them. And you try to make it so that they are pretty much bad word. I know idiot proof. We pretty much try to make it like that, but ultimately they require human intervention. So that whole garbage in garbage out really comes to mind every step of the way. If you produce a very poor program or you produce a poor recipe to run that piece of assembly equipment, then the equipment is not going to run the way it should. It's not going to for AOI catch the defects that it should. If you open up the tolerances dramatically, then the machine's going to pass everything through. And we've had people who have done that in the past with, you know, older equipment, newer equipment's a little better at catching that stuff, really, but who have opened up the, the process window so that, you know, of course the component's going to pass. Of course, you know, there's going to be issues because we're really not testing for it properly. So you'd have the best piece of equipment in the world. Like you'd have the best car in the world. You have the best plane in the world. You have the best piece of equipment in the world, but it still requires some type of human intervention. There has to be some kind of expertise in running that, or at least at least more discipline when it comes to using that piece of equipment the right way. Yeah. We, we, uh, we always watch out for what I like to call uh, trophy hunters, usually contract manufacturers that say, Hey, you know what, if we buy an AI machine, we'll look good and we'll get more business because we can say we have an AI machine. So they'll go out and buy any, you know, usually low price point, whatever product it could be a cleaner. It could be a Y could be whatever they'll even x-ray just to show that they have the capability without actually knowing, without matching the, the specific need to the specific attributes and capabilities of a product. You know, they just trophy hunt. Uh, and, and that's always a little bit frustrating because I know in my business and I, I'm sure even more in yours, you really have to, if someone says, you know, how much is a machine? We have to ask them 20 questions, you know, so that we can make sure that our product is suitable for their application. Um, and I'm sure that's the same in your business too. You got to know what's it going to be used for, right? Because I'm sure yeah, you have a absolutely. range of products. You have probably a lower range and a higher range, like most companies do. And, you know, the lower range may be perfectly suitable for something today and, and maybe it won't be. So 
Yeah, we have to watch out for the the trophy hunters, people who just want like one piece of everything without a specific specific intent on how it would be used. Yep, I agree. I agree. Yeah, we have about 10 different pro- 10, 10 different products right now in the SMT portion of our business and we've got We've got LED inspection equipment, semiconductor inspection, of course, our camera division. But just for SMT, we have 10 different pieces of equipment, 10 different machines. And of course, they range in different prices and different capabilities. It was always a matter of, and we become, you know, it's very much a consultation. When we talk to a customer, it's like, what are you looking to do? Can you tell me what your requirements are? We'll steer you to the right, at least subset of products that we believe is going to, is going to work properly for you. You know, years ago when AOI was becoming more and more the buzzword out there, because People weren't doing AOI. At one point, people didn't even know how to spell AOI. But the bottom line is, as it became more and more prevalent, there was people that would go out there and buy a very, very low-end piece of equipment, maybe some older machines, just to say that they had AOI. And I always said at that point, it would have been great just to make a box and just put the words or put the letters AOI on it. You'd probably be able to sell those for you know at least five grand a pop so that people would say, I have AOI. But really, <laughs> as you had mentioned before, some of the things that people are dealing with now and the way that manufacturing process is is becoming more difficult now. You really need your people are relying upon that AOI equipment. They're relying upon inspection in order to make them look good. I always say you can have you can build the worst product in the world, but as long as you catch all of your failures with the AOI machine before it leaves the door and you fix all those, you're golden. So that's really what AOI is. It's it's a matter of it's a matter of going through and making sure that the manufacturing process is going right and that you're manufacturing good quality boards. Sure. And it's kind of strange because you had mentioned before about value added and some people look at AOI as being non-value added because they could have people do the inspection, but that's just not the case anymore. I truly believe that AOI has gone from a non-value added to an extreme value added yeah. you know, over the last few years. And I believe that's the same, quite frankly, I believe that's the same when it comes to uh, cleaning equipment. Right? I mean, you, of course, went through that whole no clean era where people are like, oh, we're not to clean. It's like, no, that's not the case. And so it's, it's a matter of really educating the customer and working with the customer to make their manufacturing process the best it can be and make them look good because that's how they're going to grow. Sure. Hence the podcast, education. So, what's, so l- last question. And... I hope you haven't put your crystal ball away, but, but if so, take it back out. And this is the last question. What's, what's the future, Brian, what's your prediction of our industry and even more specifically your industry over the next five to 10 years, where are we going as an industry what, from your perspective? You know, I see a lot of growth still. I see there's a lot of potential still for growth as we're talking about autonomous vehicles and drones, et cetera. We're talking about electronics, I believe electronics is going to be going through the roof as it has been over the last few years. I think we've enjoyed enormous growth and I think it's all because of where we're going as a culture, right? Robotics and autonomous vehicles are going to be driving this, I believe going to be driving this well into the future. So my crystal ball, if it is working properly, is telling me that this is going to be uh, an expansive industry and it's going to continue, continue to expand, you know, well into the next few decades, well into the next few decades. I don't know beyond that, you know, but I see it as, I see there's such awesome potential there. You know, the future's so bright, I got to wear shades, that kind of thing. I mean, (laughs) but I'm going to put this back on you because you've done so many of these podcasts. What do you think? Well, I agree. I think this is an amazing time to be in the electronic, electronics business. You know, we went through, Decades of consolidation, you know that. Remember the early days of oh, Nepcon yeah. and you know the early Apex shows that were amazingly huge, and Prototronica that used to have twenty six separated buildings on a fairgrounds and with thousands of exhibitors. You know those days are gone, and the industry has consolidated. You know basically there'll be like three companies that own every all of our businesses at the end of the day. Um, well, I'm but, going to work for Pepsi. I, don't know <laughs> I prefer Coke myself, but I, I'll have a drink with you <laughs> with Pepsi. It depends what else is mixed with it. <clears throat> but I, I do think that, that electronics um, have, have all a small percentage of electronics have always been high reliability. You know, it, 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 it fails and people die. You know, the space world, the aerospace world, the medical world, you know, we're, we're a small percentage of, you know, 
uber high responsibility, uh, or responsibility, reliability requirements. And now I think that, that, that high reliability expectation has trickled down into class two and even class one products. Uh, even though people won't die if electronics fail, uh, electronics are so interconnected now that you break one link and, you know, the world stops moving. So I think uh, the, the there is a greater uh, demand for reliable assemblies. And there is also a, a greater circumstance where we are making uh, it more difficult to have reliable assemblies because we're putting them in funky places. We're putting them in on people and in people and in harsh environments. And we're building boards that are so densely populated, there is no room for error. On through-hole boards, there was always room for error. You could spill Pepsi on it and they probably still function because everything was so far apart. Now, um, everything is so dense that if a component is placed slightly askew, it might bump into its neighbor. And if there's a little bit of residue, almost an imperceivable amount of residue between those two tiny little components put, you know, so close together, it wreaks havoc on a board. So I think, uh, I think our industry, much like the auto industry in this from the seventies forward, the U S auto industry specifically got so much better because they had competition, you know, from Asia, I think yeah. our, our, uh, for different reasons, our electronic assembly industry is building boards f- that will be far more reliable um, than in years past. And that is possible due to these value added functions like inspection, uh, like, uh, you know, optical and x-ray and cleaning and other uh, technologies that uh, testing uh, technologies uh, that validate the proper build of a board uh, so that it can, if there were errors, they don't show up in the field. They, they get fixed. You get a do over uh, before they go into the so, field. So I, 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 I just I like think it's a wonderful time to be in this industry, uh, particularly in the automotive sector. I just love technology and there's no more technology now than in a car, a modern car. It's amazing. So yeah, yeah I hear you. I think you and I agree on that. So Brian, thanks for being my guest today. This was awesome. Uh, and as usual, your, you know, the passion that you have for your business and, and, you know, for the electronic industry generally and for the inspection business specifically is just always very impressive. I always watch, I always love to watch your interviews and, and, and watch you work your booth and, and, uh, it, you definitely, uh, live and breathe this technology. I'd love to see it. <laughs> Thanks. Mike. Yeah. I got to get a life. Thanks, Mike. <laughs> it's too late now. It's too late now. We're, we're, we're in this business. It was a life. We did something in a prior life that, that was yeah, really kinda, evil. Kinda and, you know what? Yeah. I, I, Anyways, I like to tell yeah, I people. I want to thank you personally. I want to thank you personally as well, Mike. This actually was a pleasure. It's always a pleasure talking to you. And you know what? I love listening to your podcast. You definitely, you definitely have a really good grasp in the industry. And uh, I really do appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Well, thank you, Brian. Good to talk to you. Well, we'll see you around. Yes, you will. Well, that's another episode. Thanks for listening to Reliability Matters. If you like what you hear, please be sure to give us a like. Just click the like or heart button below. If there are any reliability-based questions you'd like to have answered or specific topics discussed, let me know. I can be reached at mike at mikeconrad.com. That's Conrad with a K. Don't miss another episode. Subscribe to Reliability Matters on iTunes or follow us on Spotify. You can also listen to us on iTunes, Spotify, AqueousTech.com, PCBChat.com, Spreaker.com, or our newest affiliate, Ascendo Reliability on Reliability.fm, a site dedicated to all things reliability. Once again, thanks for listening. We'll be back soon with another episode of Reliability Matters. In the meantime, keep doing it right. Thanks for listening to the Reliability Matters podcast. Join us on the second and fourth Tuesday of each month for new episodes of Reliability Matters.